This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. It's episode 283 of the podcast in this special year-end episode. We're looking back at your favorite episodes of the past year. How do we know they're your favorite? Well, of course we look at all the download metrics uh, for every episode to get an idea of what's resonating and what's not. Uh, you know, But if I'm being truthful, my expectations don't always match your interest. And while I could guess that a granular episode like Eric Toft of Shinram might get shared and listened to, by an outside uh, number of our audience. You also surprised me with some huge amounts of listens for podcasts like last fall's conversation on brewing with terpenes with Brandon from new image. That episode is now our fourth most listened to of all time. Crazy caught me off guard, but Hey, you know what? We're listening. We see what you like and we try to give you more of that, but also find things that you don't realize you like until you hear it. This for this episode, I looked back at the 10 most downloaded episodes of the past year. Uh, and most episodes, even though they're young, have reached over 25,000 downloads. And I know that number probably doesn't mean much to you in a vacuum. Um, so for reference, our most downloaded is in the mid-50,000 range. And our um, top 10 starts at around 35,000 downloads. These are your this, this episode is your standouts of the past year, the episode that you chose to listen to. Even though you may have gotten behind, you know, the episodes, these are the episodes you shared with your brewer friends, suggested that they just had to listen to it. It's been a fun project for me going through, listening to them again, reminding myself of some of the crucial and valuable information folks have shared through this podcast. As always, I am deeply, deeply grateful to everyone who agrees to come on and answer my incessant long-winded questions. And from all of us at Craft Beer and Brewing, we appreciate you trusting us to bring these valuable conversations to you. Before we get started, we did a, hit another milestone last week, surpassed 6 million downloads for the podcast. We hit 5 million in June, 6 million now. We'll do almost 1.8 million downloads this year. Pretty, pretty wild for this thing that uh, we started a number of years ago. And we're like, yeah, maybe it'll work. Anyway, this will also be the last of our Tuesday episodes for now. Um, you know, we launched these in July as an experiment to play with some new formats. And while the new formats will stick around in 2023, we're going to spread them out through the regular Friday podcast schedule rather than doubling up because as much as I love bringing you this podcast twice a week, some weeks, my, my wife and kids would like to see me more often. So I'll be with you once a week in 2023. Of course, we do have some really cool stuff planned for the coming years. It's our 10th anniversary year in 2023. 10 years. Where? Where has the time gone? Anyway, let's start counting down your favorite episodes of 2022. But first, AccuBrew is a revolutionary fermentation analysis tool, unlike anything else on the market, giving brewers unprecedented insight into the fermentation process. AccuBrew helps brewers confirm consistency and avoid problems batch to batch. From your smart device, you can track and compare sugar conversion, temperature, and clarity and use that information to continuously improve your process. AccuBrew goes beyond a simple measurement tool. With the AccuBrew system, managing your process and people has never been easier. Visit AccuBrew.io today for a no-obligation 90-day trial. Also, this episode is brought to you by BSG, distributors of TNS hop oils. Looking for a way to save on freight, reduce waste, all while improving beer quality? Then change your brewing game with TNS hop oils. Visit BSGCraftBrewing.com to learn how TNS hop oils can make your beer and your margins better. And... Balancing Barley and Hops is your expertise. Food-grade lubricants is theirs. Clarion food-grade lubricants meet stringent standards of purity and performance for food and beverage processing, food packaging, cosmetic, and pharmaceutical applications. All Clarion lubricants are backed by the Clarion warranty, and they work with you to create an efficient lubrication program that helps protect your operation. To learn more, visit clarionlubricants.com slash foodgrade. Clarion Lubricants, the expert that experts trust. First up in the number 10 spot is a recent conversation I had with Mike Tonsmeyer and Scott Janish of Sapwood Cellars in Maryland. And in this segment, they discussed honing in their dry hop technique to get the most out of today's hops. There is a few areas where I think the research is really... Um, pushed us to, to move our, you know, how we were doing, especially, you know, even at home is uh, drastically different, like dry hopping wise, I think, um, you know, so like, for example, like we're going lower and lower on our dry hop temperatures. I think we first started about 
58 degrees or so, we do a soft crash, um, you know, get all the yeast out, harvest, do whatever we need to, um, and then start dry hopping. Um, and we've just found, I think, even more lately in the lower ABV beers, um, just that you can get, you know, dry hopping at the rate that we like to, um, you can get too much of an astringent kind of green um, lasting bite in some of those beers that just enhances like um, almost a fake bitterness or, you know, a vegetal type bitterness. Um, and so just like using the research that, you know, kind of shows that the, the, the colder the temperature, the less of those greener compounds you're getting, you know, myrcene, um, for example, or, you know, some of the polyphenols are, are less. Um, so that's like shorter contact time um, was less of that. Um, colder temperatures, you, you got a little bit less of that. Um, so we just, we've kept uh, dialing back, um, and now a lot of them are, are, are sub, sub 40 um, dry wow. hop. Yeah. Wow. Um, but I always like to say that's what we're doing now. And again, if, you know, as we keep <laughs> experimenting, we, you know, I'm sure in a year it'll probably be a little different, but. Um, part so, of, part, part yeah. of that I was going to say is that um, we've also uh, moved to more aggressive rousing of the hops. Yeah. And so we got like a high flow regulator to allow us to really blast those hops back into suspension. I think that was sort of our problem is that we, I think, hadn't been getting enough hop aroma. And so we went to being more aggressive with rousing. But then that caused more of all the hop compounds, including the polyphenols and the astringent sort of character. And so now we've been backing the temperature down with that more aggressive rousing as a way to mitigate the polyphenol pickup, hopefully, without hampering the uh, extraction of the aromatic compounds. Right. And I think that's a especially important when you're doing those like pretty much you know fridge temperatures because just that cold is really kind of um you know i always wish we could see inside these tanks to see what exactly was happening but i'm um, pretty pretty confident those colder temperatures the hops are dropping um, even quicker and so i think that's where rousing at those lower when temperatures is somebody going to build a tank like that because <laughs> i've i've i mean i've seen kettles like that we, uh, and mash and we kind of have water we, yeah. we we have an ultimate brew tank which is like an infusion tank and it's mm -hmm. got a little sort of porthole on the yeah. front and on the top um it's not perfect particularly with these hazy beers but yeah. you can look in the top and sort of see the you know welling up of all the, the the hops and whatever but so it's honestly what i'm more interested in is down by the cone right you know if you're just blasting up through the middle and all the hops are stuck to the side it doesn't really uh, sure, sure. accomplish much so i think just yeah. even just something simple though is after you do a rousing whatever your your technique is yep just take pull a sample immediately after and honestly do it before and after um, and it, it should look messy. I mean, it's a pretty much a hop salad at that point. It's, and that's what you want. You want those hops in the, in suspension doing their thing. So aggressively blowing CO2 through a high volume, you know, regulator on the bottom also has the potential to knock out aromatics from, you know, out of the liquid into headspace that may not come back into that liquid. How do you balance those kinds of things? Because at the same time, you've got to, you know, it's not going to aggressively bubble through if there's not some place for it to go. And so you have to reduce, you know, some head pressure or allow it to blow off or get it, you know, bring that down. You know, what is, what does that rousing process then really look like for you all? Yeah, no, you're right. It's, it is kind of a balance of, of all this, you know, I'm, Cause you I'm, start venting this off and all of a sudden, like all of this aroma is just blowing right out right. of your tank. But if it's at the, you know, if at the same time you're picking up more compounds because of it, then it's probably worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of those really volatile compounds are like the myrosines and some of the other ones that you don't necessarily want. Yeah, anyway. blow the bad those, those shit can off. Go, right, those can right. go in the headspace. But um, I, I, for us, you know, I, the the first uh, so we typically do two um, dry hop charges about two days apart, um, and I'm less worried. I think we're both less worried about losing um, you know hop compounds through a big burp on that first dry hop charge. Um, this is you know an hour or so after the hops hit the tank. Um, we're doing a big blast with hardly any head pressure at that point. Um, just the hop, to, the hop compounds that are in there have already survived hot fermentation, right, right. Yeah. flocculation. They're probably pretty well uh, in there. And the dry hops haven't done much at all at that point. And so that first burp, very aggressive, hopefully, um, you know, getting a lot of, of the ex extraction done with that. And then the, the following ones, um, there is, you know, head pressure on to hopefully retain a little bit, although even you're still pushing, yeah, um, pushing the hops up through the through the comb. But again, if if you're getting more extraction from them, it's probably a good trade off. Some of the the these bioengineered yeast strains are you know 24 hours into fermentation, there's almost already a wow type of scenario. 
Um, but we've really found that, you know, if you're dry hopping these beers really heavily, I mean, the, we've sent, sent these um, beers to labs to get, get tested and, you know, the thiol content after dry hopping is reduced a little bit, but still way it's over threshold. Still ten, 10 times or 20 times what yeah. threshold is. But it's not even close to as apparent as it was pre dry hop. So there is like a, a masking or, you know, competition going on amongst flavors and compounds. And so, um, we're still trying to figure out the best way to, to utilize those strains, I think, but, um, what have been your favorite strains to use and what have you found in using them, um, that have really made them sing, whether that's hop variety or whether that's some process concern along the way to, to me, it's leaning into those flavors. So like we did a, a passion fruit, uh, version of our all citra rings of light, passion fruit rings, but we only use, it was maybe half a pound of passion fruit per, uh, per gallon. So, I mean, relatively light as far as fruit goes. But with, uh, and we use the Berkeley Tropics strain, the London Tropics on that, it really uh, popped in, in a great way. And, and particularly in that sort of case where you're, you could double the passion fruit, but that's going to be an extra $1,000 or whatever it would right, be. Right. That's a, a case where it really, I think, doubled down on that flavor. We did a, a mango passion fruit sour, um, same with that strain the previous summer that really went over well. So to me, it's, yeah, it's like, um, figuring out those synergies where you're using a hop, again, like Galaxy Hydra. Um, I don't know if there are any other hops that are sort of in that sort of, you know, uh, fruit stripe gum, passion fruit. No, there's more and more of the red fruit kind of yeah. hops out. But. but sort of leaning into those flavors to me is the, are the ones that really sort of pop rather than having, say, a different tropical flavor. Um, we used it with Simcoe, and to me it just sort of ended up being kind of a little bit um, – generic tropical you know it didn't have that great mango popsicle thing that some um simcoe ipas sure, have sure it didn't have the passion fruit sort of thing distinctly it was just sort of pleasantly tropical which is not right what i'm excited about i i think um i really like when you're you know sort of going in on one particular thing and really having that pop there's a lot more in that episode if you haven't lined it up in your queue yet make sure you do if only to hear mike's comments about galaxy um next as the ninth most listened to podcast of 2022 was our West Coast Pills podcast. And in this clip, Sam Tierney of the Firestone Walker Propagator and Bob Coons of Highland Park discuss selecting malt for West Coast Pills. When we started working on this, it was mostly German Pilsner malt. And then um, we did eventually switch uh, to actually it's a, a Canadian malt, Gambrinus. And, um, you know, that was something that we had brought in. And you know, from our perspective, I think you know, um, we're a much larger brewery than these other two guys. So we have some other considerations, I think, you know, as far as like bulk availability, stuff like that. So we were pulling in Gambrinus, um, that we were using in Firestone Lager and that we use in AO5 Cerveza. And we were really liking that malt, super pale color. It's just really clean, but has a nice kind of, um, grassy Pilsner quality to it. It's not as robust as like, say a Wireman. Um, you're not going to get as much body and richness in the malt character. It's a little leaner. It's higher enzyme. You have to mash it a little bit differently. You're overwhelmingly going to get a lower attenuation. I mean, no matter what you do, uh, or sorry, lower finishing gravity, higher degree of attenuation. And so that switch um, did kind of change the beer when we decided to move in that direction. And it is a little bit leaner, drier, kind of snappier. It, it doesn't have as much malt richness. So that did necessitate kind of reapproaching the hops to kind of make sure the beer was correctly balanced. But um, yeah, I, I think I found that, you know, I really liked, I mean, Carahel's a really cool malt, um, you know, and I, I think a lot of brewers, you know, like that crystal in that kind of 10 range for IPAs because it's a bodybuilding and it can add some sweetness, but it doesn't get you those deeper caramel malt flavors that tend to oxidize and throw off hop character. So it's kind of like the, you know, the one you can get away with um, in a modern IPA. So um, I think that's, you know, that really helps, but I think in the end where we wanted to go was kind of making the beer, just going for more drinkability, making it leaner. And so I, I'd i imagine that um, we tend to target a, a lower finishing gravity than these other guys. Um, and that's kind of, you know, our, our house approach in general is to make it a little bit leaner and snappier. And I think, you know, that philosophy just carries over in Pilsner Brewing, I think, from, you know, when Matt first kind of honed in on the targets for when we started brewing Pivo, it was this really, you know, kind of leaner, snappier, lower finishing gravity beer. And, um, and then, yeah, I think the malt for us is just kind of working toward that end. Bob, you're pushing a whole bunch of hops into to Timbo and these, uh, you know, talk to me about how that malt uh, piece has developed over the years and, uh, you know, how you've evolved it to where it is now. 
Yeah, I think it's actually one of the more interesting parts of these beers for us because uh, so we've been making all of our West Coast IPAs are made with lager yeast. Um, and we've been doing that for probably more than three years now. Um, and so our IPAs and our West Coast Pilsners are essentially made very similarly. Um, and Timbo always has its own expression that's different than our IPAs. And the biggest thing is the malt bill is different. Um, and so, you know, our malt bill for Timbo is like 40% raw two row and then 40% environment floor malted bow pills, which is not typically in any of our IPAs, um, sorry, 45, 45, and then like 10% carafone. So I, I bring it to that environment floor malted bow pills is the outlier compared to our IPAs. And Timbo always has this, for lack of a better term, like tropical thiol-y, you know, maybe a little bit sulfury side to it that pushes it to its own thing and its own expression that we love. Um, and it's pushed us down this path where everybody talks about the malt bills and what malt, like the malt flavor or the malt itself is contributing. But I think something that doesn't get talked about as much is the nutrient load that the malt is contributing and how that shifts your fermentations, um, and drives the flavor of the beer, even the flavor of the hops, um, through that shift in fermentation. So you know, we, we don't have the resources to like really deep dive into this, but it is definitely on our sort of like radar for our research is like fan and nutrient levels in different malts contributing to, you know, fermentation expression, but also the sort of like uh, symbiotic relationship of fermentation and hop expression. Um, so, yeah, malt bill definitely matters for us in this. And that the, you know, we contribute a big part of that floor malted bow pills from Byron is a big part of Timbo. And that's what gives it what you might call a, you know, trademark kind of Pilsner flavor element. I wouldn't even say it's trademark Pilsner. It's evolved into its own thing. It, you know, lager yeast tend to kick more sulfur. I think that that sulfur can sort of transform into a more like tropical style expression. It can go more dank. Um, but I think it, it has this potential to be tropical. Um, and so I would, I wouldn't even say Pilsner. It becomes its own thing. What great and thoughtful brewers and a a fantastic conversation. Uh, If you haven't listened to it yet, definitely do. Uh, Belgium is next on our list as the number eight spot goes to Raf Souverains of, uh, as he discusses the challenges that small blenders face and his research into toxicity in apricot and peach pits. The Wamachirada have developed in a very good way, of course. They, they, you know, they, 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 they like the success uh, I was building and the name I was building for myself, and they also appreciate it very much that I didn't use their name. Of course, when people ask, where do you get the beer from? Well, I said, well, I got it from Girada and the Troch Lindemans. Um, but the Troch also, from the start, I had a very good relationship with Lindemans too. You know, some up and down, some few bumps in the road, but it's fine. Like, they're, they're, they're cool with what I do. It also expanded uh, two years ago to uh, Den Herberg. It was, like became a new producer, and right when they started producing lamb, I contacted them and said, can I buy a wart? And they were cool with that, too. So, um, yeah, you just... Because that's another thing that's happening in the last two years, at least now, is there's a lot of home blenders who are doing what I was doing seven, eight years ago in my grandma's house, and it's fantastic if that happens, because back in the days, if you look at 100 years ago, there were hundreds of blenders everywhere. Like, pretty much every bar in and around Brussels was a blender, because they had barrels of lambic, and they blended their own stuff, or they served it, they did whatever the fuck they wanted. Uh, so it's nice if that part of the culture is coming back, but it's not nice that people start producing beer, and they put on the label, oh, this beer contains Girardin, uh, and then they put, like, a little splash of Cantillon in it, too, because that looks very good on the label, you know, with all, you know, with all respect to Cantillon, it's a very good thing, beer indeed. But, you know, people start, like, showing off with other breweries names on their homebrew labels which is you know like you're, you're basically trying to turn to use someone else's success to build your own thing and it's you know you gotta build your own thing it's very hard of course to make your own name and and, and but then again you know you just 
focus on making a beer because there's those there's some of those homelanders they, they spend so much time on their fucking instagram accounts if they spent that much time on their beer their beer would taste a whole lot better <laughs> they should rather do that you know because <laughs> it's really i mean yeah. the beer world and that's that's every business is like that you know it's marketing 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 but some 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 breweries are just about marketing oh a name a good name you built for yourself and it takes time and it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of very good product and then the name will get out there and people will recognize that as you know a sign of quality and like they know like okay this guy makes good beer and then you know generally then it's not always part sure, of it. sure. <laughs> Lamic is the most flawed beer there is so that's the beauty of Lamic <laughs> We, we squeezed it literally because we used the whole fruit um, and then and, and, uh, two years ago I actually bought a, a machine that really very much helps us but we, we used to do it all by hand which is just crazy it makes your hands I mean you get arthritis if you do that Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so no, we, we basically uh, uh, squeeze the fruit and then throw it in a hole like with the stone and everything because mm. I think that I well if you look at stone fruits stone fruits have for me they have three main flavors one is the skin of course there's a lot of oils in the skin, a lot of perfume and everything. Then you have the flesh. In the case of the, the vineyard peach, it gives just the typical peachy flavor. But in the, in the skin, you get like that that aromatic quality, that perfumey quality, a little bit of like like a a plum strawberry perfume comes from the skin. And in the flesh, you have typical peach aroma and peach taste. And from the pit, you get a little spiciness, that almond character too. And in most pits of... Uh, of uh, stone fruits, there's, there's a component called benzaldehyde, which 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 exactly is almond aroma. And that's also what you taste if you taste an almond. If you taste a pure almond from California, it, that tastes like almond because that has the highest load of benzaldehyde. Okay. <laughs> and in peach pits, African pitch, it's less to a lesser extent. But the thing is, like you have those three flavors in a in a, in a fruit, because you see a lot of brewers they open the fruit, they throw away the stones. Uh, because to an extent the stones are toxic that is true it's sure. not just about benzaldehyde there's also precursors to uh cyanide right, <laughs> and right. that's not very healthy but you know it's it's all at some point I, that, that was in 2015 actually i made a test and and we were actually separating the stones from the vineyard peaches and i filled the whole bucket like a 30 liter buckets but seven and a half eight gallons i mean more or less eight gallons i filled an entire bucket only pits only stones from peaches and then at the end of the day, I filled it with beer. Just I covered all pits in beer, and that was it. <laughs> Let it sit for three months. And what came out of that was sour amaretto. Literally, it was pure almond taste. Huh. Lambic with almond taste, like very intense almond taste. And then, of course, there was the, there was the question, like, is, is this going to kill us if we drink yeah, it? Did you get it tested for if cyanide? You, if, you have to, if you have to believe people, that thing will instantly kill you, especially when you talk to American brewers. Because, you know, Americans are afraid of everything. So, so he's just scared. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, Cut hey. this out if you want. I've got thick skin. I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but and then, then I had the, the luck, too, at that moment. Uh, a friend of mine, she, she's working, uh, she was working in a pharmaceutical lab right next to the toxicology lab at the University of Leuven. And uh, so, yeah, sometimes I could give her samples for analysis of this and that. And I actually had a sample of that uh, put in uh, to see to check for uh, cyanide. Right. And yes, it definitely did contain cyanide, but, man, you would be dead from the ethanol way before the cyanide would get you. <laughs> so, the concentration so was the so concentration low. The concentration was absurdly low. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just that the benzaldehyde was I. The benzaldehyde is that the aroma that gives that, huh. that almond flavor. So I was like, all right, this is fine. Because also at some point, it was three years ago, uh, a beer. So that, that's the noyau, basically. The noyau means the, the pit uh, right. flavor. So I made the beer called uh, Frambose Noyau, Piazza Noyau, where I take uh, Frambose and I put that uh, apricot stones. Because apricot stones have are, are more, they contain more benzaldehyde than peach stones. So I use apricot stones. Uh, infusion in lambic and then I add it to the raspberry beer to make it so so much softer and smoother. When I first uh, exported those beers to the US, actually the, the FDA needed a few samples because of the ingredients listed. Right. Uh, because it might, you know, there might be a health hazard. Fair enough. I, I, sure, I love sure. those things. You know, those, those those agencies are there for a good reason. Uh, so they got they got tested and they were completely fine. So, yeah. There's, there's sometimes you do things and you really have to get same thing with peach leaves for example the leaves of a peach tree is absolutely amazing if you take the young leaves of a peach tree and you uh, 
do you call this movement? You rub it on, mm-hmm. on your, between your fingers, and then you smell your fingers, pure almond. Pure almond. There's also benzaldehyde in those leaves. So you can also use those leaves in beer, but you should not crush them. If you crush them, you release all the cyanide. Oh. <laughs> and that's why if you, for example, have peach trees uh, and, and in the same field you put horses, if horses start eating it so they crush the leaves, Horses can instantly die from it. Wow. And a horse is a big animal. Right, And right. it just takes a few peach leaves to kill a horse. Huh. So you have to be careful if you, especially if you go into to those territories where you are like, let's not just include the pits of the beer in the beer, uh, the, the, the pits of the fruit in the beer, but let's only use the pits. <laughs> right. <laughs> you have to be careful in things sometimes and try to not kill yourself in the process. Sure, <laughs> sure. We stay in Belgium for the number seven podcast of the past year as Jean Vinois of Cantillon talks about brewing with aged hops. Yeah, so we are working with uh, aged hops. So uh, it means that we let hop oxidize in contact with the air. Um, and so to, to, to decrease the, the, the uh, acid alpha present in, uh, in hop because we, don't look, we are not looking for a bitterness. Lambic is an acidic beer and we are working with the natural acidity of the beer. Um, and we are working with uh, with hop because hop uh, contains a natural preservative, uh, lupulin, and we are working with a lot of hop because we need such a preservative to uh, it affects to keep the way the beer. bacteria works. Yeah, and and, uh, th- and the other way, yeah, uh, hop uh, avoid the bacteria development. That's why we are mainly working with uh, with hop, but we are not lo- looking for bitterness. But when you ha- you let hop oxidize. Uh, the flour, because we are working only with uh, with with, uh, with the real hop flour. We don't we don't use pellets. Uh, develops some uh, some cheesy flavor, and the only way to avoid to find back the cheesy flavor in the beer is a long boil. So that's also uh, another reason why we let the the word boil for uh, three three thirty four hours. It volatizes off those com- yeah. cheesier compounds. Yeah. 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 How do you age those hops? Are they just uh, packed when, in when barrels? We, when they? we buy, for unfortunately, we are not. Uh, the, we we don't have the right equipment to let the hop aged in uh, in the the, the 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 building. So when we buy hop, uh, we buy it after two years. So for example, there uh, we are working this season with hop uh, from uh, the season. The harvest 2018 and 2019, so uh, two and three years. Uh, we got here the 19 in September, so we will keep it till the next season. But we don't keep the hop for more than one year normally because we uh, we, we have not the right equipment to do it. And you're using noble hops, and we use only noble hops. Yeah, so already low in alpha, but. As we were talking about before, you, there's not a specific variety that you insist on. You are simply looking for no, rough I, parameters. I, I per, it's a personal choice. I, I, I like Alerto, uh, but we are working here with uh, Alerto, Erzbrucker, with uh, uh, Saz, with uh, Golding. Yeah. Up next is Barrett Tillman of Black Man Brewing, who shared the story of a poignant moment when he realized the need to take his brewing career in a different direction. Things were, they were just kind of getting shifty for me, you know, like I, I felt like I was in a position where I was I was drinking too much, you know, and I, I didn't have a strong personal foundation. And um, what what happened that really shook me up there is is I came home after after shift beers, pull into the driveway, spitting sunflower seeds out of the out of the window and an officer walks up to my car and he's like, hey, what's up? And I'm like who are you and why are you here? You know? And 15 minutes later, I'm in the back of a cop car, you know, with the, oh. with the DWI case. And I'm like, holy shit, you know? And so that was, that was in 2017. And I was like, I'm, I'm championing this industry, but you know, like I, I don't really have much to show for it, you know? And so as I'm, as I'm trying to, to navigate that, you know, mental health, you know, physical health, you know, taking care of yourself while also having the the pressure and the stress of, you know, like being in the industry of, of, of brewing, being in the industry of alcohol, you know, late nights, heavy drinking, you know, um, I, I tell people during that time, my, my resting blood alcohol content was over the legal limit. <laughs> That's resting, you know, functional alcoholism is a thing, you know? And yeah, so, yeah. 
And so that that's that's really the need to take a sabbatical. That's really the need to kind of take yourself seriously and um, and put put your life before your job. And I think that that's that's kind of where I'm at now. A lot of people go cold turkey and just get out completely. But you have figured out a way to kind of manage that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, at the at the time, you know, like I, you know, like it, the only way to to live and be responsible is to, is to take responsibilities for your actions, you know. And so here I was, you know, like in the highlight of my career, you know, like looking at a, a DWI case, you know, like in DWIs in our in our industry is common. Um, why is it common? It's because, you know, like you're you you're going to have a, a 9% beer at a bar. You know, if you walk into a bar right now, all of the double IPAs start off at 7.5%, you know, and they're, and they're sweet. So, oh, okay, cool. You know, like I, I, I drink that like soda, soda's sweet too. Let me have three of them. You know, as soon as you had the, the, the one and a half, you're at the, you're at the limit right there, you know? And so to, to get in your car and drive, yeah, you can you can operate a motor vehicle, you know, just like soccer moms operate a motor vehicle on Benadryl. You know, it's the same thing. Um, however, we're in our cars a lot. We drive around a lot. We're representing the industry a lot, you know, and and cops are everywhere. You know, you may get pulled over for a tail light. You may get pulled over for speeding. You may get pulled over for for not turning on your turn signal, you know, you didn't get pulled over because you were driving recklessly. You got pulled over for one of these things and you just so happen to smell like alcohol because you've been in a brewery all day. You've been in a bar all day. So there you go. And this is a, it's a compounding effect for you as a black man. You, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the social reality and the you know, statistical reality is that you are at a greater risk of being pulled over already. And yeah. now you've ad- you've added that extra factor to it. Yeah, it's 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 an easy it's an easy thing, you know, like like. Um, yeah, it's 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 easy to to be to be targeted in that in that way, you know, like any sign of aggression and like like when this officer walked up to to my vehicle in my driveway, I'm like. What the hell is going on here? You know, like what's what's happening? And I, I you knew were arrested it. in your own driveway. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, <laughs> it's it's okay. You know, like this yeah, this is yeah, this yeah. is the this is the country that that we live in. You know, and um, and the truth is, it was it was then my word against his. You know what I mean? And so, yeah. and and so. How how do you how do you fight that you you fight that with with money you know um you you fight that with years of time you know there's there's plenty of people that have DWIs you know there's plenty of people that tried to fight DWIs and and couldn't get out of them and so it was it was more of a reality check for me you know yeah um and and I, I take that as a as a as a great as a great sign you know because. I, I remember standing on on a bar one one night because you know, we do this kind of stuff, you know. I'm standing sure. on a on a bar, and this this was at one of the big festivals that we were having. And um, in Texas, we like to do this thing called shotgun, yeah, <laughs> and um, encouraging 300 people to shotgun a beer. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing? And so when when I when I climbed off of the bar when I was finally off of the bar my my best friend in brewing was was there he he runs a a local brewery here it's it's called intrinsic brewing and smokehouse and um I said to him Carrie Carrie Hodson it's like that's the last time I'm going to do that and that's the last time I shotgun a beer because you know like there's 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 this industry appeal that you you have to be this this flannel wearing bearded you know like drunk alien who's who's really great at making beer but but it's also really great at handling beer that's an alien no no one can do that you know that that ends up 
that ends up being a hard time for your friends and family. You know, it's a great time for people who came by the brewery to to meet, you know, like the brewer. But, you know, like you talk to ex-girlfriends and ex-wives and they can tell you a different story. So that episode is full of more poignant moments just like that one. So give it a listen if you haven't yet. Um, up next in the fifth most downloaded episode um, from this past January was Kyle Harrop of Horace Agedales. And here he discusses his technique for using coffee and beer. You know, at home I tried every method possible. There might be one I haven't tried, but I haven't thought of it yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're talking cold brew, um, fine ground, dusting it into sand, um, you know, all across the board. And what I've come to um, think works best for me is 24 hours whole bean, uh, steep it in a tank like a... Uh, you know, it's funny when people ask me about my adjuncting, I, I describe it as a tea bag a lot of the time because yeah. I'm basically putting the flavor deep in the beer. Um, you know, I do recirculate and do those things too, but coffee especially, I think the gentle um, extraction you get from a whole bean that's not overly roasted and not under-roasted um, just adds a crazy expression to your beer and uh you know i've i've met a lot of people over the years that do things completely different on the coffee spectrum i'm uh, typically about a pound per barrel i talked to Corey king and phil uh so Corey at side project and philip perennial and i think one of them does seven pounds per barrel and the other <laughs> does 10 on there and i'm just like wow that's so much but, um, you know, their beers are great. And I, you know, stump and coffee shop vibes right off the bat come to mind as some of my favorite coffee beers. And sure. Their, their method completely different than mine, but um, it works too. So I don't think there's, you know, perfect way of doing things, but my, my way has been uh, pretty much just one day in, in the bright tank before packaging. One day, whole bean in the bright tank. Uh, what what kind of temperature? Um, in the high thirties, typically. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, you know, that goes back to the other methods. I know some people that swear by doing it early on in the sixties. And when I've tried that in the past, I get like a peppery. I call it nacho kind of um, bite that I I can't handle. I can't. Once I smell that, I can't even drink it. So. Um, I try to stay away from that and then, you know, not pulling out too much acidity. Coffee can get crazy tart um, if you're not careful. And I found that with doing like cold brew extraction at home a lot of the time. So I think my paranoia kind of shapes how I do it now. And there, you know, there's other brewers that do things a lot different that have great success. But that's been, uh, been what works for me. When it comes to selecting and roasting coffee, um, what does that look like for you? I mean, how do you, you mentioned Jamaica Blue Coffee, Jamaican uh, or Blue Mountain Coffee and Gesha Coffee, but, uh, you know, is there some method to what you're looking for in those flavors as you select that? And then, again, how it's roasted in order to kind of bring the flavor out? Yeah, I mean, pretty much every year I buy um, an auction lot of Gesha and that can vary from a couple hundred dollars, you know, to over a thousand dollars a pound. So Jeez. what I'm looking for in that coffee, it's so delicate. And, um, you know, if you, again, don't roast it enough, it can get quite acidic. Um, if you over roast it, it kind of ruins all of its characteristics. So finding one that's chocolate and vanilla forward. Um, Geisha's got this like jasmine floral thing going on that I really like in stout, um, especially pairing that with vanilla or nuts. And uh, I look for for those bold flavors. I, I try to shy away from, you know, like the citrusy ones or uh, the lighter berry notes. Coffee's crazy. I mean, you, you can sit down and cup 10 different coffees from the same region and 
they're entirely different. I, I don't know if it's my palate or not, but I can't find anything else where that's the case. Like if someone put 10 of the same wines in front of me or same varieties of wine from the same region, they would probably all taste the same. But, you know, the coffees are all across the board for me. Hmm. It's not a huge surprise that the next few podcasts all focus on hoppy topics. And this podcast, the number four spot from Zach Frasher of Slice, got into the very narrow ways he brews excellent IPAs, such as selecting different Pilsner base malt for each beer, depending on the hop used. It is all Pilsner. We we do use a different a variety of different Pilsner malts. We don't oh, yeah. we don't rely on one Pilsner. So um, why yeah. and what Pilsner malts? So uh, so the one you had was was Rar Pils, um, and we like Rar Pils. Um, I f- we feel like it's got a little bit more with pH. It got a little more acidity than the other ones. So you know, uh, it's a little more acidic, meaning we use less uh, acid uh, in the mash or adjustment. Uh, we keep the salts the same, the ions. Uh, for the profile of the beer. Um, it's very easy to work with. Conversion's good. It lauders really good. It drops clear. Um, so you know, I'm not trying to plug RAR too much, but you know that is that is a very good malt for us. Um, I didn't put you up to that just because they, they sponsor the podcast. From, you know. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, we also like, uh, we like Gambrinas. Pilsen. Cool. Uh, super lean, really light. I think, I think Evan from Green Cheek, told me about that one, turned me on to that one. Yeah. And they were, you know, we were trying some of their beers back then. And, and I'm like, man, these beers are so lean. And so we have certain, we have certain malts with certain hops that we feel work better together than others. What? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's just like, what? Yeah. So like if there's I, certain Pilsner malt that works better with certain hops, yeah, oh, yeah, you got to yeah. tell me about that. <laughs> so, I mean, so like back to the Gambrinas thing, it's extremely lean, right? Okay. And and the, the shelf stability on our Gambrinas beers are are pretty amazing. I, I could crack a can like most of the time, two and a half, three months later, and it's tasting pretty bright still. And so for us, we have we have a series of um, it's, they're all like New Zealand hop beers. So it's it's usually a single New Zealand hop, but we've done one recently where we blend them all. So it's 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 called our blinding series. We have like a blinding sunrise, blinding sunset, blinding sunlight, and then the last one was blinding moonlight, where they're all blended. So there's something with like Nelson and a very lean canvas that just like works really well together versus having a bunch of malt in there. I, I'm not sure. And not like other Pilsner malts have a bunch of malt, but RAR and some other ones that I could rattle off, they do have a little bit more shoulders to them than like Gambrinas. So Gambrinas to me, it can almost be maybe too lean for like a competition beer. Huh. Like a judge might knock it. Right. Like, like literally we got knocked at World Cup and GABF for some of our beers. are <laughs> like, this is, this is like Pilsner level, you know, like beer. Like right, this is like, right. like a lager. I love it because it rocks. It rips for the hops. And it's a good showcase for like this New Zealand character. We've done it with like Pacific Northwest hops and it doesn't quite pop the same way. Hmm. I don't know how to explain it. So Interesting. Just trial and error, you know. So um yeah, yeah, with with the New Zealand hops, Nelson, Rawaka, Nectaron, those were like the three single ones we did in the series, and then the last one we blended all those together, um, and it it just it it rips, you know. You have any of that on tap? Because I'm gonna have to try some of that uh, if you have anything I, left. I, I don't, man. Oh, <laughs> crushed, crushed. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> and, and we've done it. We've done like that with like mosaic too, yeah. like 100 percent mosaic beer, and it it does really good too. But something with New Zealand. And I don't know if that's um, maybe something from like the old school, like Alpine Nelson, you know, it was just like this, like Nelson kind right, of showcase right. with like a pretty simple, you know, malt profile, uh, but like West Coast kind of like really crystal clear version sure, you know, sure. in that aspect. So that, that was something. So that, those the, are those the two kind of Pilsner malts that you tend to use or is, or is there anything else there that uh, hits your, your malt base for these? Well, those are workhorse. Um, we recently brought in uh, CMC, Superior Pils, Canadian Malting Company. Mm. Uh, we use that in our Beechwood collab. So so Shrego, he kind of turned us on to that for our double. And then we rocked it in a couple singles and a couple more doubles. And that's another rad malt too. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it, nice conversion. You know, lauder's really good. Um but that and the Rar, guy knows a thing or two. Yeah, yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that that um, CMC and the Rar, they definitely have more more body and shoulders than like Gambrinus does. Hmm. So I think there's like a a place for these malts with hops or kind of the vision of the way you want the beer to turn out, you know, versus just having a silo of um, 
you know, your 100% two row or Pilsner malt, and then you just run every beer that way. We could, and it, they probably turn out still pretty good. Um, but I think they're a little bit better based off the vision of what you're going to have with these hops and malt, you know, how they balance out. So, Do you use all Pilsner malt then in your West Coast IPAs, or do you ever duck into some, some two row? So uh, I'll, I'll rewind a little bit. So back at, at Moonraker, we did like a lot of different things. It was like two row. It was like Pilsner. It was like, we'll splash in some Munich, some Vienna crystal, you know, Carafoam. Um, Throwback. It, it, totally. But, but you know what? Those beers were pretty, still pretty lean. And, right. and so some of the curve here, when I commissioned slices back at Moonraker, we had steam facility, you know, on, on our, on our burner. It was, it was a steam brew house, both facilities that I commissioned there. Here it's a direct fire and it rips. So it really wants to caramelize more than a steam system would. Mm. So when I first did the first beers here, they did have some of those components that those old recipes had in them. Right. And there was some crystal malt in the IPAs. There was a little bit of Munich. There was two row base. And I'm drinking these beers and I'm like, they're good for a couple of weeks, but they're they're falling off a cliff pretty fast, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And um a lot of it, you know, is like some of that crystal malt you get from like the UK, it's it's already oxidized. It's like oxidized malt. So you're already at a disadvantage when you put it in your beer from day one. You're like sure, mashing sure. in like oxidation, you know. Um, and then you couple that with like real oxidation, like, you know, like high, like maybe well, we never had any issues with TPO or like DO, but, sure, but sure. still it's there. And then some Maillard reaction from a direct fire kettle on top of that. Totally, man. You know, you throw in like some Munich malt and rock a 90 minute boil. You're just you know, asking for, you know, some kind of a component of sweetness and right. and being it malt driven versus hop driven. And so trying these beers, you know, as I kept brewing them, I'm like liking them more and more as I'm taking out malt, you know, and just kind of like, Hey, let's like, let's scrap this. I'm liking it more. Hey, let's, let's cut this back. I'm liking it more. And so we, I mean, we've just settled on this kind of array of Pilsner malts. Um, now that, that, kind of work for us we'll still use some hmm. two row uh but like it's crazy if we did the same beer that was 100 percent raw two row versus like gambrina's pills or even raw pills um they're like different worlds you know huh. so we still dig two row but we might even blend it with pilsner sometimes it's kind of just the vision of what we want the beer to be as an end result uh, if we want like a little bit more body or character with the certain hop varieties or if it's a collab you know we're receptive right. to kind of using some stuff that's kind of out of a wheelhouse so your third favorite podcast of the past year featured the methodical approach of eric toft of Shinramer. and while we aren't going to listen to his crazy approach to buying malt from different maltsters who all farm at different elevations as a hedge against climate variation we are going to listen to his thoughts about what makes for quality in noble hop varieties so we were using hops from all these countries, different varieties, and I recognized in Belgium the, the difference that the hop variety can make or the hop terroir or the, you know, it's the country of its origin uh, it can make sure, on, sure. on the, 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 you know, the, the flavor of the beer and the aroma. So I started Since really... Consistency is your goal. And consistency, right. yeah. So I really started looking at the, the hop in a, in, a, in a method, in a way to express um, the flavor of our beer. So take going away, we were using um, uh, Brewer's Gold um, at the time, which was very common in Germany about that time. So Brewer's Gold extract, tradition, and Perle. Um, eventually got rid of the Brewer's Gold and the Perle. Tradition is still one of my main hops. And I branched out. Uh, we had some Hesbrucke as well. Um, uh, and, and since then, we branched out. We've kept tradition. Uh, tradition, Hesbrucke, uh, and have t picked up Safia, Halita, Mittelfru, um, Tetnanga, and then some of the newer varieties, uh, Mandarina Bavaria, Kalista, Ariana, and some very rare varieties that are grown in Tetnang from one of my farmers. Uh, they're actually originally French um, land varieties, so Petit Blanc and Tardif de Bourgogne, and I don't think I've left anything out. Um, yeah, Halletau Middlefru, if I mentioned that. I, I like to use those from Halletau and Tetnang because the Tetnang and Middlefru is very different than the, from the Halletau Middlefru, and the combination is what, what does it. The combination. Yeah, so it's the, the fruity, citrusy, lemon character from Tetnang 
and more of the piney, light pine floral character that you get from the Holita. So as you you mentioned, you use these hops and this, these newer varieties. How are you employing those within the beers that you make? Are these going in small amounts into existing beers, or do you design new lager beers with some of these hops in mind? Well, we're, when we're doing seasonals or, or one-offs, uh, I, I will often use a single variety just for many years. Um, well, I'm still doing it, actually. We, we have our Christmas beer, which is actually a, a classical Mietzen. It's about 650 hectoliters a year. Uh, we brew it in August to be uh, served starting the first Sunday of Advent. So it gets a good 10 weeks of lagering, even more a little bit depending on when, when Advent starts, but sure. uh, somewhere between 10 and, and 11, 11 and a half weeks um, in the cellar. And that's a 14 Play-Doh, um, big Mietzen, uh, using Vienna malt, sort of a, you know, the way Mietzen beer used to be. Um, <laughs> and I've, I, I've probably, well, I've gone through all those varieties with that beer over the year, over the course of the years, and... It's, but it's always single hopped. I've done it with Mandarina Bavaria. I've done it uh, uh, with 36 BUs. I've done it with 18 BUs. Um, tried a bit of everything. So people look forward to that beer because they know it's going to be different every year. And a couple years, well, three years running, I did it with Tetnong from the same farm, but from a different lot. <laughs> hmm. So it's uh, that's one one way to play. With the varieties, uh, with the, the our biggest, our flagship beer is the the Hellas, that makes up eighty percent of our sales, and people expect consistency, um, reliable consistency. They don't want any experimentation. So, I blend um, four different varieties um, for that. So it's always tradition, Spalte Select. That's one I forgot to mention. I was think I was missing one. Spalte Select, um, Hesbrucka and Safia. Actually, right now I'm blending a uh, Holotau Middlefru into it, so I'm using five hops at the moment. And I did a, about a year and a half uh, where I had a little bit of, a little bit too much of uh, Mandarina Bavaria, and was also using that. You know, it's all hot side, so if you use it early enough, it does very well in Alice. Without an aromatic pickup there. Right. But that, you know, because hops are an agricultural product, there is some variance from year to year based on how that, that harvest looks. You know, if you know, that blend allows you to, uh, you know, it allows you to adjust for various characters right, yeah. and uh, and whatnot that might happen in that. How What does that process look like for you? How do you then approach thinking about that blend, knowing that maintaining that consistency is your goal, you go into hop selection then and you right. are selecting these hops and thinking about them and then figuring out how, like what, how does that process look as you then start to develop what that blend might look like as you move on for the new season of hops. Right. It's i uh, I'm I was always go to selection. I, I spend a lot of my time in the hop yards um, during the harvest and then we'll select on, on pre-harvest. So just, smelling, sniffing things just before they're picked. Already thinking that might be what, what I want and then seeing how it comes out uh, out of the kiln. So it's a lot of sniffing and rubbing and uh, getting into it. And so for each variety, I have a, a particular uh, desire, a desired character, desired aroma. I'm not, you know, there's, it was Dave Grinnell from Boston Brewing Company said, uh, Selecting hops is not is not a beauty competition, so you know they don't have to look great. I mean, they shouldn't be uh, horribly damaged or diseased or, or you know full of one disease or another. But a little bit of um, damage actually helps to you know improve the aroma or the alpha acid because that's a it's, it's a reaction of the, the hop plant to a little bit of that stress uh, to, to a stress situa yeah. situation yeah so so i have a particular desirable characteristic for each variety that i try to reselect every year how do you articulate what that is you know how do you lock that i mean it's it's living somewhere in your brain does that live in in, in a language or does that uh, how would you describe some of those characters that you are looking for yeah, there's uh, there are just a few like bullet points for each variety that I'm looking for. So when I take my assistant with me, or I'll take an apprentice, 
Uh, so I tell them this is what I want and or what I think is right for our beer. And um, for, well, tradition was bred to emulate Halletal Mittelfru. Problem was it was Mittelfru then as now is, uh, is a very, uh, it's very susceptible to weather. And uh, so you have alphas anywhere between two and, and 5% or even more. This last year was five and a half percent. On the average, it's around 4% over 10 years. So, um, you know, the, the tradition was, was bred so that it would emulate the character of Halletal Middlefru, which it does pretty well. It's sort of like the centennial is to the cascade, you know, sort of a, uh, more of a, a higher alpha variety of that with a more reliable yields and reliably higher alpha acid content. So I'm looking for that. It has a light citrus floral character, a little bit of pine in the background from the tradition. The Hezbruka often has a um, um, combination of um, orange marmalade and, and lavender uh, Safia uh, um, has a bit of lemongrass and mango. These are little background. The German hops are all very uh, herbal and floral and piney, but these leaves, it's, it's more like the nuances in the background. Right, that right. Are, We're not talking about this in hazy IPA terms where it's very easily digestible yeah, and understandable yeah, as that thing. These are yeah. um, overtones, undertones, mm, like right. s- very, very small subtleties. Spirit Select is also it has a very it has almost a sweet aroma that can can go toward pina colada it can uh, be have a little bit of coconut a little bit of pineapple uh, but at the same time is very classic um, Tetnang there there are two different sort of tracks of Tetnang you could say there's um, the more earthy um, spicy variety. And there, there's there are very many different clones of Tetnang. So there's the earthy, spicy, and then there's the more the uh, light lemon zest. And I'm always looking for the lemon zest. I like the spice, but I like the lemon zest more. So that's very dependent upon Tewa and uh, where it's grown. The number two podcast is one from December of 2021, but is a December pod. Of course, last year it wouldn't have had enough listens to appear if we had done this kind of episode last year. Um, but this one more than deserves to. Of course, Kelsey McNair of North Park had a great year with some very important World Beer Cup and GABF medals and hoppy beer categories. And this episode shed some light on how he was doing that and how he has continued to do that. The old school approach of, okay, we've got, you know, a first word edition and a 60 minute edition and probably a 30 minute edition and 15 and a, you know, flame out, um, you know, all that stuff. Um, my approach lately has been like, let's not cook the hop so much. Um, and some of that comes from, you know, our honing in on trying to make better hazy IPAs. So, uh, you know, we're very, wait, 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 wait. Now you're saying that you're brewing hazy IPAs has improved your West coast IPAs. I 100% would say that. Um, yeah, no, I mean, like, like the notion of doing, you know, low temperature hop stand in the kettle, um, you know, some of our West Coast IPAs uh, might get like a very gentle first wort or a 60 minute edition, but then we may not add any more hops until we're at like 170 degrees. Um, and those beers, you know, are incredibly popular. Um, they still have enough bitterness from that very early hop edition, but we're getting, you know, so much more, you know, just fruit forward notes and, um, you know, we're not getting these really kind of deep, uh, I guess, infused flavors that you get from boiling the hops. And then our, it's really been like all those mid additions, let's pull those out and throw them into the fermenter, you know, and we've cranked our West coast dry hop rates, you know, into the, we're north of four, you know, on a lot of them. Wow. Um, and, some of you know pretty much every single IPA for us, whether it says it on the label or not, is is double dry hopped. Um, and you know, uh, like the Imperial IPA uh, that we meddled with at GABF this year, um, Army of the Kind of Deadish, uh, which is the imperialized version of our sort of mostly dead. Um, yeah, I mean that beer is you know north of five pounds per barrel in the dry hop, um, and 
you know, two stage dry hop. Um, we do spin the tank uh, a couple days after the second dry hop. So we're really resuspending hops in a major way. Um, and how long for each of those, uh, those dry hop regimens? Um, and I so, love that you describe it as two stage. Cause I was going to ask you that one. Yeah. Well, how you define double dry hopped. Right. Um, I mean, double dry hop for me isn't always two X, but it does mean that we're splitting up. Um, but some would say, you know, okay, well, a standard West coast IPA dry hops probably in the, you know, two and a half to three pounds per barrel. I think by most standards. So we, you know, when we're in north of four, I mean, I think it's pretty easy to say that is pretty close to double the amount. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll do usually do a gentle hop addition when we're uh, close to terminal gravity, like one degree Plato away. Uh, and a lot of times that'll be like cryo ops. Um, and then we'll do our why big, why why cryo ops? Um, just looking. For you know, there's a lot less vegetal matter in there um, and trying to not uh, oversaturate with polyphenols. We get plenty of that when we do that uh, recirculation. So um, really just trying to keep the vegetal matter out early so that the uh, beer doesn't have extended contact time um, on all of those, uh, those vegetal components. Um, and then, so we're, we'll do that like a degree Plato away from terminal gravity. Um, and then uh, a couple of days later, we'll go ahead and uh, hit it with the like major amount of the dry hop, um, which could be like 80% of the dry hop at that point. Um, and then usually the next day where we'll, we'll do the research and then we'll crash it the following day. So it's a, it's a pretty short dry hop. Usually it's, uh, you know, from, from first dry hop to crash, it's like four days. It's interesting because a lot of the alternative, you know, versions of hops that we can get now, Cryo, Lupo Max, uh, Incognito, Spectrum. Um, Salvo. You know, yeah, I mean. All it, of the, there's all, all the that, products, right. All that stuff. For me, anytime I see that, I'm like, that means I get to use more hops. <laughs> you know, it, and, and it's funny because a lot of these products are designed from the perspective of, oh, we're trying to give you as a brewer more yield efficiency. And I'm like, no, that just means I get to pile on more. Um, you know, I can and, crank up the flavor without getting the negative side effects of that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and we've embraced like all that stuff. Um, we do use a lot of cryo. We, uh, if, it, if the hop's not available in cryo, but we can get it in Lupo Max, you know, we'll give that a try. Um, we've really embraced, uh, incognito in a different way. You know, it's, it was designed as a hot side product. We actually dry hop with it a lot. What? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's been kind of in my back pocket for a while, but, um, I, I don't know. It's how do you dry hop with incognito or, or f like a flowable hops product like that? Um, you load it into the fermenter before you knock out. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and I mean, you know, j just thinking about it in terms of temperature, because, you know, it does generally need heat in order to, you know, be absorbed to right. flow so, through and be absorbed in a liquid. So you knock out a barrel hot. Okay. And then you turn on the heat X. <laughs> so you, yeah. so let, let, let me get this straight. You're knocking out hot into a fermenter that has this in it. And then pulling it back out of there through a heat X to get it back down to the right temperature. No, um, you, no, you're you're knocking out a barrel hot, and then you turn on the heat X, and it'll bring the tank temp down. You know, as you're knocking out. Oh, okay. That first little bit needs to get mixed up. Oh, okay, okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, we we tinkered around with with all kinds of stuff along those lines. Um, and uh well, well, so why you know what's the difference in dry hopping with a product like incognito you know from a sensory perspective for you um really for me when we so uh sidestep uh this whole idea kind of sprouted from a first collaboration we did with scott wood from courtyard brewing uh courtyard's a uh, little brewery down in um, new orleans and Scott used to uh, live out in San Diego before he moved there and opened his brewery. Um, we, he was pushing into our collab to use varietal specific uh, CO2 um, extract products uh, in the kettle. 
um, during the Whirlpool specifically. And we did get character from that that I hadn't experienced before, and I liked it. But I was like, when I would, when we would go and rinse out the kettle at the end of the process, I'd be like, well, nothing, none of like too much of this is still sitting here right, right. in the kettle. And I like kept tinkering with devices to try and bring it further and further downstream. And it wasn't. And so, I mean, like we would load it into a hot back and run through the kettle and push it through the heat exchanger and, uh, you know, try and get it into the, the kettle, I mean, into the fermenter. And, uh, you know, we would find that when we'd run the CIP, because it hit the heat X, got cold, it just resolidified. And then, um, you know, our CIP liquid would turn green. And it's like, well, we didn't get that where it needed to go. And so it was just kind of like a pragmatic uh, uh, final approach to just load it into the fermenter um, and knock out a barrel hot. And that idea actually was when we brewed a collab with uh, with uh, Tim and Connor from Cellar Maker. Um, Tim was like, why don't we just throw it in the tank? And it was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I see what you're saying. When you say knock out a barrel hot, you mean the first barrel is going in hot and then then yeah. you're, you're then activating you, the heat X right. to then yep. bring the temperature down on the rest of everything that's going through there. Yep. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it's that's so interesting. smart. Um, and the flavor that you um, get, like when you start tasting, you know, your samples uh, a few days in, um, it's it's like it's already been dry hopped and, and it doesn't come with all the baggage that you get when you've dumped a bunch of T90 in it knock out or, or, uh, you know, into your fermenter, like knocking out onto hot pellets. Um, it's, it's a much cleaner, like it still has a very intense, like resinous burn to it. But by the time you get to the end of the fermentation cycle and you're crashed out and ready to package, all of that's kind of faded. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been. It's and you been get to enjoy all of that bio transformation that occurs in the process too, right? For sure, um, and and that's definitely you know something that works obviously well in, in hazy IPA. Um, but uh, yeah, that was something that you know took some 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 other people's ideas and just tried to figure out how we could make it into something that um, yielded really cool results. And that brings us to our top episode of 2022, the one that you all listen to the very most. Um, that one explores, of course, the subject of thiols. It's, it's definitely the buzzword of the year. And we saw that and what you all chose to listen to. Here, Ben Smith of Surly shares some of his thoughts about this cutting edge of brewing. Talking with Lauren Lance at, at Omega, they, they've they done a bunch of these beers. And, you know, like, should we go heavy with adjuncts? Should we do, you know... Um, Pilsner malt versus two row, et cetera. And they said they, they've had a lot of luck just using Pilsner malt. Mm. Probably has something to do with uh, maybe the longer kilning um, degrades some of those precursors in, yeah. in two row or even any um, higher uh, uh, kiln malt. So um, kind of separately, we've also been playing around with the Ericlea malt from Vireman. Sure. Um, so we ended up using some of that. Um, which is really interesting. It's a it's Italian grown barley that's sure. then brought up to Germany to be malted, and it's got a um, little more bold uh, characteristics for a Pilsner malt, which which I really liked, and we figured that'd be a good kind of backbone for a beer that's going to be, you know, pretty heavy on the kind of the tropical fruit aromas, but um, to give it a little bit more kind of body and base, but still provide some of those balanthyl precursors that the the thylized yeast could really free. Uh, so we, we did that, and we still added a little bit of oats. Versus going to something like, a, you know, Maris Otter or Golden Promise exactly. with some of that kind of English heft to it. Yeah, which that's kind of the first place I went. We, we, we use a lot of Golden Promise here. Furious has a, has a you know, big chunk of Golden Promise as its malt bill. So we kind of started there, but then ended up transitioning over to, to Pilsner just based on some of those recommendations. Mm. Uh, it would be interesting to do kind of side-by-side side and just change the base malt just yeah. to see what happens. Um, but I'm really happy with how the Ericlea – uh, worked here. We did add some oats just to, to make sure we have a good little bit of residual body and uh, want it to be a little bit hazy. Um, you remember r- roughly what kind of percentage of oats you put into something like this? I think we did. I think it was like 10% oats. Then we had a little bit of wheat as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and But it, honestly, it's still pretty primarily um, just the, the space malt. Yeah. 
Uh, and yet you've still got a nice, uh, you know, hazy uh, a beer out of it. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a bright haze. It's not not super cloudy, right. um, but that's that's great. It's 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 a really nice beer. Yeah. Most of our hazies, we don't do any hot side hops, or if we do, it's just it's whirlpool. Yeah. We're doing a lot of um, so the calculations get weird since it's, yeah. it's all coming in. And, yeah. Most of the time, we're adding hops right at the beginning of fermentation, and then again later during fermentation for for those beers. Um, so it's it's usually little to no hmm. actual IBUs, but yeah. we all know you're going to pick up some bitterness sure. just in general, um, and that's been very successful for us. Do you have a way of like even mentally? considering what that might be i mean i mean again there's there's the software can't really give no, you numbers for that it's it's yeah and, and it's just by feel and also personally like ibu is so um i mean i want to say subjective like yeah darkness ibus compared to like a, a pilsner ibus are crazy but the pilsner is going to taste more bitter than darkness you know it's just your base beer um really plays such a part in what that perceived bitterness is so right. i'm always more like my sales guys will ask me what the ibu is i'm just like low moderate high like that's that's it <laughs> sure like, sure it's it's a it's one of those measurements that i don't take a lot of stock in uh personally and we don't really measure here for and sure like, you're thinking about perception you know yeah, and, and finishing it's, gravity it's all about sensory at that works point. in conjunction with that which also yeah. works with like thickness and malt body and all those are, are various pieces of the equation that affect that perception of it that might be different from the actual numbers yeah, I think the analogy my friend Gary Nicholas used was it, it's like going down a hill and if you're on a bike or in a car like that hill could be very different in terms of your perception of it, right? Mm. Um, you could be going 30 miles an hour on a bike and you could be scared shitless. You can go yeah. down in a car and it's no big deal, you know, and that's kind of how IBUs are. It depends on the vehicle that, that you're in, what, what that actually means to uh, kind of the flavor expression uh, and the the perceived bitterness you're going to have when you drink that beer. Definitely. So for this beer, we we just did one dry hop towards the end of fermentation. Um, for some of our, our other kind of more hazy um, IPAs, we'll do uh, at least two hop additions. And we found it really successful to add the hops basically at the same time we're pitching yeast. So um, And so they're in there at the beginning of fermentation. So that's, I mean, from a production standpoint, that's crazy because... You know, yeah. Now, I mean, if you're not planning on reusing this <laughs> yeast, and you know, it's not as big of a deal. But uh, yeah, you got to have a different. You, you can't crop yeast, obviously. Right. But um, that's that's what we do for like drips and drops is our, our core hazy, and that's that's the process for that. Like we zero hot side hops, and then we're adding hops basically. Um, when we're pumping the beer into the fermenter, we're adding the hops as we're pitching yeast. What's uh, the difference between doing it then and waiting till you've you know already kind of mostly fermented the beer and can pull some yeast off first? Um, and we've, we've done it both ways and we've, we've done a lot of side by side comparisons. Like I'm, I'm really big on, let's do like three or four brews and sure. just change one thing at a time and really study them. And I'm very, very, um, uh, lucky cause I've got a great lab, a great sensory team that, that can actually do that sure. and, and give me that data. Um, and we did, I think we did 13 different brews before we launched our original hazy one on mosh pit like years and years and years ago and um we're also doing a stability testing at the same yeah. time so is the haze going to hold up because um in minnesota unfortunately it certainly can't sell beer direct to consumer we have to go through our distribution chain and beer's got to have at least a 90-day shelf life for us to uh to be viable um because last thing i want to do is someone to pick up a beer and have it taste sure. or look sure. like crap so we actually put a lot of thought in the, the front end of that beer and, and, you know, it took us probably six months to really develop it. But we found um, we just got better flavor expression, um, cleaner beer flavor, um, and just general preference from, from doing that process. So we would add, you know, we did like basically day zero or we could add the first one, you know, day one, two, three in fermentation. And then, you know, obviously another one at terminal and across the board everyone just preferred that first one so whatever is happening in there um maybe a good question for laura from megan sure, next week sure. um whatever is happening during whether it's biotransformation um how it's reacting during fermentation you're going to get some volatilization during fermentation which is what i was worried about too like we're going right. to lose a lot of aromatics if we're adding it that early um but uh whatever's happening it's awesome and it works so uh at least for us and then adding that second uh dry hop load basically right towards the end of fermentation close to terminal um has just been really successful for us so that's that's kind of how we do our normal uh core hazy uh brands uh but for this one we knowing that we we didn't need to use a lot of hops we just did that one small dry hop i think again like one and a half pounds per barrel uh or somewhere between one and a half and two pounds per barrel yeah. uh at terminal um was, was all this beer had at the thyle and air with other half and um 
and again, it tastes like there's probably six pounds per it barrel It tastes like a much, yeah, a much heftier hop bill. Than yeah, so it's, it's wonderful to use that low amount of hops, and apologies to my hop suppliers, you're not going to like that, um, <laughs> uh, and, and get the same kind of sure, uh, sure. Uh, flavor profile with, with just using a different yeast is, is pretty amazing. Yeah. It kind of blew my mind, to be honest. I, it, uh, it's one of those things, like, they say that, but I think I should use more. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but, but you really didn't, you don't really, you, you don't have to, so it's cool. And there you have it, our top 10 episodes of 2022, um, with some segments from each where I, that I thought were particularly salient, interesting, um, and just might be a nice little jog your memory um, to pull back some of these big high moments and smart comments from some of these great uh, you know guests on the podcast. Of course, every guest on the podcast has got great things to share with you, and I don't mean to uh, downplay the contributions that anyone shared with us over the year. I just thought it might be fun to walk through this and see what you all listened to the most of um, and try to figure out why you did it at the same time. Thanks for joining me on this look back. AccuBrew is an analytical tool designed to collect and compare the information brewers need to produce consistent results. TNS hop oils from BSG are a revolutionary hop product that gives your beer all the intensity with none of the astringency. And let Clarion Lubricants work with you to create a lubrication program that protects your operation. Of course, subscriptions to craft beer and brewing are great gifts for those fellow brewers in your life. And while you're at it, you might as well treat yourself. Go to beerandbrewing.com, click on that subscribe button, spend some of that holiday money that somebody gave you. Um, give a gift to someone who matters. Maybe you forgot, and uh, this is your chance. Um, just send them that gift subscription. Whether it's a friend or yourself, help us make a difference in the brewing world. We'll have one final episode of the year later this week with Josh and Rhett from Inner Voice in Atlanta. And after that, I will catch you in 2023 with 52 more great conversations on brewing with some of the best and most inspiring brewers in the business. Cheers and happy, happy New Year's. And here's to a fantastic 2023. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.com.